Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to this Hollywood Institute for Global Peace and Security special talk. Um, we're very pleased to be joined um, by those here in the room and uh, online today um, to hear Professor um, Alex um, Alvarez. Uh, I'm Stephen Haig, uh, professor of history here at Rowan University and director of the Hollybush Institute for Global Peace and Security. Um, the mission of the Hollybush Institute, if you're not familiar with it, um, is to preserve and build on the legacy of the 1967 Glassboro Summit by promoting scholarly research and programming related to the history and practice of international peace, uh, security, and the rule of law. Our goal is to foster and promote international and intercultural um, dialogue. So we are delighted to welcome this afternoon um, Professor Alex Alvarez, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Northern Arizona University. Um, from 2001 until 2003, he was the founding director of the Martin Springer Institute for Teaching the Holocaust tolerance and humanitarian values. 2017 and 18, um, he uh, first, I think, came to Rowan uh, when he was serving as the Ida E. King Distinguished Visiting Scholar in Holocaust and Genocide Studies um, just down the road at Stockton University. Uh, Professor Alvarez has published widely in the field of genocide studies, and his books include uh, Governments, Citizens, and Genocide, Native America and the Question of Genocide, and Unstable Ground, Climate Change, Conflict, and Genocide. He was a founding co-editor of Genocide Studies and Prevention and is currently an editor for Genocide Studies International. Professor Alvarez will speak for about 40 minutes, um, and we should have time for some questions uh, and answers um, uh, as this is a hybrid event, if you are online, um, please do use the chat box to submit questions. And uh, those will be fielded by my colleague, um, Dr. Debbie Sharnak. Uh, when I um, went out the door this morning of my house, my wife asked me, um, uh, you know, what's the topic of the talk this afternoon? I said, oh yeah, we're, we're talking uh, Dr. Alvarez is going to talk about climate change, authoritarianism, and the future of genocide. And my wife said, oh goodness, that's a big topic. Um, I think it is a very big topic, a very ambitious topic, but there's no one better to lead us through it than uh, Dr. Um, Alex Alvarez. Please join me in giving him a very warm row and welcome. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Okay. Everyone doing well? <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> I always feel like I need to uh, ask that question because, as Dr. Haig just mentioned, you know, these are heavy topics. And, um, but hopefully I can give you a sense of some of the things that I've been thinking about and um, share with you some insights and ideas um, on issues that are very important to me and to others and to give you some food for thought um, as we move forward from here. So first off, it gives me great pleasure to be here um, to have this opportunity to speak with all of you. I do want to, before beginning, extend my thanks to my friends here at Rowan University, especially Professor Stephen Haig and the Holly Bush Institute for Global Peace and Security, Professor Jenny Rich, and the Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights, as Dr. Haig mentioned, I had the privilege of being here at Rowan and meeting both of them back in 2017 when I was a visiting professor at, in Arizona, if you're from NAU, you're not supposed to mention ASU or U of A, but it sounds like it's okay to mention other universities within the state. So at Stockton University, and it feels good to be back here amongst friends. I also want to thank all of the sponsors and supporters of this event for making it possible for me to be here with you this evening. And it's a privilege, truly, for me to be here to spend some time talking with you about some issues that I believe are important for us to be thinking about. Now, um, I have spent quite a few years studying, researching, and writing about the origins and dynamics of genocide. In fact, I was just recently reminded how long I've been doing this when I was at a um, college meeting where um, we were introducing ourselves to the provost, uh, 
in this big meeting, and the provost asked everyone, uh, who are you, and when did you come here, and that kind of thing, getting to know the college. And I've known our provost for 30 years, and so forth, so jokingly, I was the last person at the very end, I said, Alex Alvarez, I've been here since 1990, and my colleague next to me gasped, literally gasped out loud, and said, I was only two. <laughs> So it made me realize I've been doing this for a while. Um, my therapist says I'm going to be over this soon, hopefully. <laughs> so anyway, um, and in that time, I've, I've seen the field of Holocaust studies, genocide studies, change and, and evolve. And what increasingly demands my attention is the struggle we are now facing to make Holocaust and genocide relevant to the lives, the concerns, um, to us living here in 2023 and beyond. It is increasingly difficult, I think, for young people sometimes to understand the importance of studying these issues, especially for some of the historic cases, um, such as the Holocaust, that are moving from lived experience into history. Um, Holocaust and genocide studies, in my opinion, must be as forward-looking as it is past-looking. We can't focus solely on past instances of genocide without applying the insights and lessons to contemporary and even potential future cases. If we continue to ignore the relevance, the, um, the lessons in ways that connect with us here and now, we risk diminishing genocide studies into insignificance and even irrelevance. Um, and in fact, that is part of what the symposium that we are convening here later in the week is all about um, addressing. And it is in that spirit that my presentation this evening is intended. And the reason why I emphasize this point is that the lessons, the insights we garner from studying these past events is even more important than ever before. We just need to look around us today to see the importance of these issues. So I wanna just briefly highlight some things that to me call attention to the need to study some of these kind of things. So as we speak here, the war in Ukraine continues to rage on. I think it's entering, what is it now? It's second winter. Um, even though it doesn't dominate the news as it had, and even though officials continue to investigate on the ground war crimes and possible charges of genocide. Renewed violence has broken out once again in the Middle East um, with fears of it spreading and becoming much more regional, drawing in a variety of other nations. Genocide in China, um, largely cultural, but also with disappearances. Um, against the Uyghur minority group continues unabated. In Sudan, a coup attempt led to renewed fighting while the world's newest nation, South Sudan, continues to struggle with armed conflict. In Myanmar, the Tatmada military continues to persecute the Rohingya minority, while Rohingya refugees in neighboring Bangladesh are increasingly targeted um, as hostility against them grows within the communities that they find themselves in. Violence in the DRC um, threatens to erupt again into large-scale um, violence, um, <clears throat> in many ways aided and abetted by neighboring countries that continue to profit from its status uh, largely as a failed state. The human rights crisis that began unfolding last year in Nagorno-Karabakh with blockade of the Lachin Corridor, ended with the Azerbaijani takeover of Artsakh um, and what is arguably an ongoing case currently of ethnic cleansing. The Horn of Africa continues to struggle with, civil, uh, with food insecurity and the risk of widespread famine and civil unrest in a region that has in recent years been marked by civil war and insurgency and um, other kinds of conflict. Social unrests, protests, and violent crackdowns continue in Iran. There are many other examples that I could mention, but I think the point is clear. 
I, I could go on like this for the next hour. Um, the world is rife with conflicts, potential conflicts, incipient conflicts, social and political instability, and other issues that illustrate the relevance of genocide education and awareness. Keep in mind, one of the underlying facilitators of almost all examples of genocide historically and in the contemporary era have been other wider conflicts and genocides erupting either during or in the aftermath of those other kinds of conflicts. Now, in recent years, my own work has focused on a particular issue which involves exploring the ways in which climate change will heighten risk factors for the development of violent conflict, including things such as riots, pogroms, war, and even genocide. Now, even though climate change is by now a largely accepted reality, a lived experience, as we are increasingly understanding, most attention, however, continues to focus on what this means for the natural world around us. And that is important. I'm not trying to diminish that. But as someone who studies violence, as someone who studies human communities and the ways in which divisions and othering and other kinds of very human qualities continue to play out in these destructive kind of ways, can you guess where my mind starts going, right? Historically, it feels to me like we have largely felt that we exist independent from the natural world around us. And I think that is something that still very much dominates our reporting, our understanding, our reviews of uh, climate change and its impacts. But the thing we have to understand is that we do not exist apart from the natural world, but we exist as a part of the natural world. And the natural world um, is something that has influenced and shaped humanity from the very beginning. Human beings, both individually and collectively, have always had to adjust to climatic and environmental conditions and changes in the world around them. Civilizations have risen, have fallen as a consequence of climatic conditions and changes. And as technolo technologically sophisticated as we now are, this fundamental reality has not changed. For all of our tech, all of our gear, all of our modern conveniences, the world around us still shapes us in very deep and profound ways. And what I want to suggest to you is that climate change will increasingly challenge the ability of communities, of nations, and regions to cope, to ameliorate, and adapt. Now there's a lot to this. I don't want to go into all of the weeds with you, but to give you a sense, what I'm going to be suggesting is that what we are seeing now, the thin end of the wedge, so to speak, more extreme weather, more weather variability, weather-related disasters, and all of these will serve to act as stresses. They are challenges that communities, that nations need to confront, need to adapt to. And if they are unable because they lack the adaptive capacity or the resiliency or the human or economic capital, right, money, for example, to address these changes, they risk greater social unrest, the rise of alternate centers of power, think about terrorist movements, extremist groups, and so forth who come in filling that gap, and potentially engaging or coming into more widespread conflict. Okay, climate change impacts. We are seeing this around us all the time. I, I participate in a speaker series every year in Sonoma, uh, California, Rona Park, beautiful part of the country. When I first began speaking there, people were kind of like, okay, now when I go, they get it. You have a state that has had catastrophic wildfires, resulting in a lot of loss of life, loss of property to the tune of billions of dollars. It has a state that has whipsawed back and forth between extreme drought and excessive snow and atmospheric rivers that have resulted in widespread flooding. 
where I live in Flagstaff, Arizona, that's my house by the way, this was all my own labor, um, <laughs> and just one storm, we were the fourth snowiest uh, city in the country last year. Unusual. I used to go, I had a buddy, um, some of you may know Paul Bartrop, um, who taught in Florida, and I would visit him sometimes. This is Fort Myers Beach right next door in the aftermath of a hurricane. Um, this is a small town in Kentucky called Hindman, Colorado, uh, Hindman, Kentucky. It's in the heart of Appalachia. Um, I rode my bike through there um, as part of the Transamerica Trail um, two summers ago, and not three weeks later, this was the scene there as catastrophic rains absolutely devastated what is already an impoverished part of the country. We are seeing these kind of events that once were rare, that once were um, singular kinds of events happening with greater frequency. And this is the real risk because adaptive capacity depends upon a certain level of um, change that we can meet. But what happens when those changes continue one after the other and each converging and amplifying the impact of the other? What happens when you have wildfires such as we saw in Oregon where something like a third of the population was displaced and that happened in the middle of a, of a pandemic, right? You have these things come together in really difficult kinds of ways. All of this is gonna take a lot of adaptive capacity, a lot of resilience. And we're already seeing some of this. We are seeing, for example, in Arizona where I live, I live up in the mountains, down in the valley, all of you have heard of Phoenix, right? Very hot temperatures. One of the things they are beginning to do is they're beginning to put solar panel over all outdoor um, parking lots for uh, big shopping areas, grocery stores, and so forth. And what that does is it provides shade for vehicles, but the solar panels also then power um, the businesses in the area. They are painting streets white. Um, and what they're trying to do is change the albedo of a community that is considered to be this heat island. In other words, you have heat that hits Phoenix during the day. It's absorbed by all of the asphalt, the cement, all of the bricks. And what happens is at night, that heat that is trapped in those is radiated out. So last summer, you had Phoenix experience over 30 days of 125 plus degrees temperature, where people, when you fall, you get second and third degree burns. At night, it didn't get below 90, 95 because of all of that heat radiating off of all of that infrastructure, right? So people are beginning to look at how we can adapt and how we can make changes that allow us to confront some of these um, kind of things. Um, but it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of creativity. It takes a lot of money. <clears throat> and so what I'm suggesting is that we are going to see a lot of these stresses that are going to really challenge us. It is going to have a situation when there are pre-existing conflicts, maybe those conflicts become a little more um, existential. When you have multiple things, boy, I really should have cleaned this up, pardon me. I'm one of these, when I see a PowerPoint and there's a typo, I'm kind of like, <laughs> now I'm realizing karma is not a good friend of me. Um, our ability to cope is eroded. You know, all of you have been in situations where you're good at coping at the first part of the semester, but by finals, maybe not as good. And it comes out maybe not always in the nicest or healthiest kind of ways. Well, that's true for all of us. That's true for us collectively, where we've got a certain ability to adapt, but boy, once you pass that threshold, it, it gets hard. And what happens when we look at it communally is that pre-existing schisms, pre-existing tensions can be heightened or amplified where small differences around race or ethnicity or religion or politics can take on whole new dimensions where existing social and political instability is just increased. And Fragile states become more fragile and, and so forth and so on. You get the point. We could talk about this 
for a very long time. But I think you get the point, right? These are challenges that we increasingly understand we have to confront. And it's difficult to do so in a world that is becoming more unpredictable. Human civilization is built upon predictability. We have to be able to predict when we plant, when we reap um, our crops. We have to have predictability in terms of the behavior of people around us and so forth. And what we are doing is we are entering an era of greater instability that is going to really test our willingness and our ability to meet these changes. And so <coughs> we, we worry about some of these stressors overwhelming the, co the ability of communities and governments to cope and adapt. Two years ago, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence distributed a report, and it was the first ever report um, in the US um, on climate change, and it represented the first ever collective assessment of all 18 US intelligence agencies about the risks climate change poses for national security. The report not only identifies regions and nations, and we're gonna talk about some of those in just a sec, that are particularly vulnerable to instability and conflict, but also points out that such situations tend to produce large numbers of refugees, an issue we are also going to talk a little further along today. Um, and these refugees are vulnerable not only for exploitation, but also persecution. They can stay, uh, destabilize surrounding regions and they create, just at a human level, massive humanitarian disasters. Another US government report released around the same time details the um, up to now financial and human costs of climate change and then projected it forward and concluded that climate change will cost hundreds of billions of dollars every year just in the US alone. And it will result in thousands of additional deaths from the direct and the indirect consequences of a warmer world. Can you guess at this point why I don't get invited to a lot of parties? <laughs> oh no, here he comes. All right. We have to understand that in many ways, these impacts will negatively affect us in interrelated ways around infrastructure and transportation, energy demand and production, domestic and international trade, clearly agriculture, fishing, tourism, water availability, healthcare, and every sector of society. And these consequences are not limited to the US, but are truly global in their impact. There's no nation or region in the world not affected by these consequences. So where do we see some examples that can help provide some of what I'm talking about and even with a few examples to illustrate how we are beginning to see some of this. So for example, generally speaking, North Africa is considered to be at high risk because of low adaptive capacity and low resiliency. And the reasons for it are things like environmental fragility, desertification, drought, and endemic poverty. And we find, for example, a very recent report um, has found that Lake Chad, which is um, in this area where there are five countries or four countries, what is it, four here, I think there's a fifth very close here. Um, it is a vital support, uh, su source of water for this part of Africa, it has shrunk by 90% in the last um, 60 years because of drought, irrigation, building of dams, and population increases. And what this has resulted in that is happening now, even though it's not in the news, is that it's fueling violent conflict, migration, and extremism. What do you think it means to be a fisherman who goes to work every day now armed with um, AK-47s to protect your fishing grounds. Herdsmen and farmers and others are increasingly coming into open violent conflict with each other because they're struggling and fighting with each other in an effort to survive. 
right? It is literally about life and death, having access to this much diminished source of fresh water in a region where fresh water is, um, is, is not very common. The report um, that I saw recently found that um, this has fueled vital extremism. Um, think groups like Boko Haram, if that rings any bells for you. Um, it has displaced something like three million people and it has left of around 11 others, uh, 11 million others in need of humanitarian relief. Just a bit further north um, in Tunisia, President Kais Saeed has been purging political opponents, politicians, journalists, activists, judges, and others as he moves his country towards more authoritarian rule. Now, one tool he is using is racial fear and othering. He has been targeting immigrants from sub-Saharan Africa and suggesting that they are bringing crime and violence and are trying to change the demographic contours of Tunisia. Now, in, in case this sounds familiar to some of you, it should. It is a Tunisian version of Great Replacement Theory, um, which is a white supremacist belief as we've mostly seen it here. Um, um, it's also been used in Hungary, for example. Um, and it is about the idea that a certain group of people are being targeted for elimination through demographic changes, through immigration, these kind of things. Keep in mind, here in the U.S., most of the perpetrators of mass shooting events in the U.S., think about the grocery store in Buffalo, New York, the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the Chabad in Poway, California, El Paso, Walmart, all of those shooters, think also um, in New Zealand, the Christchurch um, uh, mosque shooter, um, all were subscribers, if you will, to this great replacement theory, sometimes also known as white genocide. Um, okay, West Africa is also considered to be at high risk with low resiliency and, a, and low adaptive capacity, largely because of endemic political corruption and pervasive ethnic conflict. The conflicts of the past often have a long shelf life and those divisions can be resurrected in contemporary crisis situations. We see in Nigeria, for example, increasingly violent conflict between herders and farmers as resources become more scarce. It is a violence that is often amplified by tribal and ethnic differences. To make another connection for you, let us not forget that the 21st century's first genocide in the Darfur region of the Sudan had many of the same kinds of dynamics. This is not there yet, but it could be. Similarly, we see that the Indian subcontinent is also at high risk for conflict and violence for some of the reasons you see here on this slide. And we can see some of these issues at play in the increasingly heated conflict around border issues in the Kashmir region of India that has actually recently erupted into violent, albeit small scale, and very localized border clashes. And really what it comes down to, in many ways, it's about access to water, which Kashmir is rich in, but which all three nations not only want, but need for their industrial, agricultural, and community needs. Now this is scary since all three are nuclear powers. Both Pakistan and India have fought wars in the past. We also know that India has become mu much more authoritarian in recent years and its politics are increasingly ethno-nationalist in orientation. Now, Europe and North America, on the other hand, are generally considered um, relatively low risk. Much of it um, is because of wealth that makes adaptation possible, right? It costs money to build new or retrofit existing infrastructure, to build and rebuild, to get supplies and resources for those impacted by disasters, changing environmental conditions, to relocate populations after disasters. But even this is finite. 
And even this varies tremendously depending on a variety of various kinds of political, social, economic, and other kinds of factors. And these consequences, the ability or inability to deal with these kind of things is not just always localized. And if we look at Eastern Europe, for example, where, as we all know, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, a, a conflict that actually began years earlier, and I think it was 2014 when Russia went into the Crimea. This has been a continuation of that. It is a war that has been marked by not only war crimes and massive human rights violations, but which is also potentially genocidal given the attempts to destroy national identity in Ukraine, the destruction of symbols of Ukrainian nationhood, and the removal of Ukrainian children um, from their families, from their communities. While this war is not, I would argue, an example of climate-induced or climate-facilitated conflict, it does illustrate some important points. While it is portrayed by the Russian leadership, um, as a defensive war against Ukrainian Nazism and the influence of the US and the West and so forth, we shouldn't neglect the fact that the eastern portion of Ukraine is incredibly resource rich with mines and industry. In fact, eastern Ukraine has Europe's largest deposit of rare earth minerals. You like the, your electric vehicles or your smartphones or these kind of things. They all depend heavily on some of these. We also know that this one conflict has had worldwide impacts. In the Horn of Africa that I brought up earlier, where they are again on the verge of famine, um, they have been facing drought for something like 40 years, and they depend heavily on Ukrainian wheat to help feed their population. It's because of this conflict, much of that supply has been cut off. And again, now they are dealing with widespread food insecurity, teetering into outright famine in a region in which states are weak or failing and where there has been a history of conflict going back decades. Now, we could talk about many more of the kind of pathways that connect climate change with different kinds of conflict, but there are two that I want to highlight in the time I have um, that I think are the, the most salient and the most immediate. And the first is about resource loss and scarcity, but then this is the one I want to really highlight, population displacement. We know around the world water has already been a flashpoint for violent conflict. It has already strained relationships between, here is a sample of countries that have come into um, conflict that has sometimes erupted in border clashes, um, those kind of things. And we also shouldn't be surprised that there is a connection with um, war and genocide in other areas. If we look at the Darfur region of the Sudan, while it's often been portrayed as a genocide that originated in politics, religion, even race, um, the underlying issue was access to water in a region that was experiencing greater desertification. And if you look at the particular dynamics of how it evolved, the composition of the Janjaweed militia that was organized, facilitated, and trained, and set loose by the government, um, they were coming from those who had the most to gain from attacking more sedentary agricultural portions of the country. Syria, we all know the, the violence that uh, has, that took place there, gave birth to the Islamic State in Syria. Um, incredibly horrific conflict. What we also often don't recognize is that I think from 2006 to 2009, all of northern Syria experienced a dramatic drought that destroyed livestock and agriculture. It, it basically dislocated um, millions of Syrians who fled the region going into the cities. And so when Arab Spring comes through the region, you had a large body of discontented, un happy people who are ready to embrace change, who wanted to challenge the government, and as we all know, the government reacted with very heavy-handed um, extreme tactics that helped bring that country into this conflict. According to the UN, close to a billion people around the world do not have access to supplies of clean water, while another two and a half billion 
do not have sufficient sanitation for sewage and waste disposal, something that lends itself to the transmission of disease. Um, these diseases that come from the lack of um, uncontaminated water kill something like uh, half a million people a year. Um, there are some who have even suggested that um, dysentery kills one child every 18 seconds, 200 children an hour, and something like 5,000 children every single day around the world. In fact, one of the biggest killers of people around the world, not violence related, is uh, the lack of access to clean potable water. Um, all right. And that's expected to, to get even worse. This, um, there have been some uh, news reports I've read recently I, in some of the news feeds um, how the U.S. population is going through its groundwater supplies like there is no tomorrow. And if we keep doing that, maybe there won't be. Um, we are really depleting our supplies of clean, fresh water at a pace we don't even realize. We often don't realize it's not just about you know, turning off the water when you brush. It's also about all the clothes we buy, all the products we buy. In Phoenix, Arizona, the big economic um, initiative that the city is very excited about is they have a new processing plant for chips, right? Right, like the, in your computers, that kind of stuff. What a lot of people don't realize is manufacturing those requires huge amounts of water. We don't think about it, it's technology. Anyway, okay. According to the UN, it is water, not land, that limits the um, amount of agricultural production. Now here's the other one. Population displacement. These are just pictures taken off the internet just to get a sense of what we're seeing all over the world. Um, and there's a lot to it I'm not going to go into. The ways in which um, climate change relates to population displacement. Sometimes it's about climate change processes, right? Long-term droughts that slowly make it more difficult to live, or climate events, things like disasters, floods, catastrophic floods that displace people. And each of them results in different kinds of displacement, whether internally displaced populations or migrants who seasonally head out looking for work and over time it becomes a little less seasonal, a lot more permanent, um, or refugees who flee the, the failure of their state or because their state has descended into violence and fighting, uh, flee. The biggest driver of population displacement in the world historically and in the present day is violent conflict, especially civil wars and especially genocides. Now, where are we today? At the end of 2022, the numbers of displaced populations exceeded 100 million for the first time ever that we know about. And they break, the UN breaks it down, the UNHCR breaks it down by category. But essentially, think about this fact. One out of every 78 people on this planet has been displaced from their homes, from their communities, um, from their families and so forth. One out of every 78 of us. And what we are seeing as a consequence to these rising numbers of people who are fleeing their countries, who are fleeing their homes in search of what? Safety? Security, opportunity, the ability to sustain their life. What they're experiencing increasingly is a lot more rhetoric, hate, violence um, in places all around the world. We have seen even in ostensibly progressive, forward-thinking nations such as what in Western Europe, for example, you know, countries we often associate with some of the uh, advocacy they've done over the years in terms of international human rights law, in terms of protection of refugees, the Schengen Agreement, these other kind of things. Even in those countries, we are seeing a huge increase in support for far-right political parties that typically gain a lot of electoral traction on explicitly anti-immigrant rhetoric. And we see this in Germany, we see this in Denmark, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Greece, um, in Sweden. I mean, countries, some of them that you would not think of, right? Um, remember Brexit a few years ago? 
the number one reason that people gave, the it was 33% of all the respondents in terms of why they supported it, guess what the issue was that was the issue for them? Immigration. All right, so, and so that's where we are now. One out of 78, uh, uh, just over 100 million. Okay, so we are somewhere right around here. You with me? It's a lot of people. The International Organization on Migration suggests that by 2050 it might double. Christian Aid has done some work on this. They suggest it might be 700 million. Most recently, the Institute for Economics and Peace did a study and they suggest it may well exceed a billion people by 2050. The human climate niche is shrinking. The areas where we can live, right, comfortably at least, and in some places where we can live just period, that niche is shrinking. And we are going to be seeing a lot more people on the move. But we're not alone in this. Or I should say, let me put it slightly different. We're not exempt from this. We often think of this as a terrible issue for those people, right? These faraway places and so forth. The US government came out with some projections looking at this issue and suggesting that um, something like one out of every 12 um, in the US will in the coming years be on the move. Sometimes it will be because of heat, people moving north and especially west, a lot of this has to do, especially here, are you familiar with wet bulb temperatures, right, where it's heat combined with high humidity, and so it compromises your body's ability to cool itself. Um, and so people are going to be leaving the Mississippi River Valley and other areas that have a lot of heat plus humidity. Wildfires. Agricultural yield decreases, and in coastal areas, sea level rise. And we know something like almost half of the world's population live within something like 50 miles of coastlines. I think 32 of the world's largest 34, 36 cities are essentially harbor or estuary um, cities, very vulnerable to these kinds of changes. And the one thing we know, history teaches us, that rapid population displacement results in a lot of social upheaval, higher crime rates, higher social inequality, and so forth. This is something criminologists have long studied. And so one of the real fears that some criminologists are beginning to look at is what is this population within the United States, what is it going to do to those communities that are on the receiving end of these large numbers of um, people. Historically, we also know that that kind of wide-scale social upheaval has resulted in years of conflict. For those of you who are students of history, if you think about the end of the Second World War, um, the end of the Holocaust, we think we have this image in the mind of VE Day and, you know, you know, sailors kissing women in Times Square and celebration and the world went back to peace. The reality is that Europe was a, a continent um, in transition for decades with ethnic cleansing, with persecution and pogroms, civil war, revolution, um, you name it. That persisted for many, many, many years. So the question is, okay, so we're running out of time. I'm just gonna move this along here. Um, we need to understand displaced populations are often very vulnerable. Um, the legal protections for people who are displaced are, are very limited. And in fact, there are all kinds of easy get-arounds that nations are able to employ, such as shelter in place, that kind of thing, that allow um, states to get away with not having to live up to international obligations. Well, what happens when those numbers increase dramatically? We like to think of our rights as being invested in ourselves as individuals.
right? Inherent, or uh, the term you're probably familiar with, is inalienable. The reality is, it's states that protect your rights or choose not to. And refugee populations lack power. Think about power in different ways. Power can be economic, it can be social, it can be political. It's manifested in many different ways. But refugee populations are atomized, they're fragmented, they lack economic capital, political capital, and the social capital that comes out of that atomization, that fragmentation. And the protections that we have in place are inadequate, to say the least. This is all happening at a time. I almost feel like, okay, that's good for tonight and tomorrow, <laughs> part two. I wonder how many of you would be back. Um, it's happening at a time when we are seeing an increase in authoritarianism, and I'll, and I'll explain why this is important. We are seeing liberal democracy has been on the retreat, authoritarianism, ethno-nationalism, in other words, national identity nationally or narrowly defined around particular identity markers, right? You belong to a certain ethnic group or tribal group or religious group or so forth. Those are on the rise. Authoritarianism is particularly dangerous for the kind of violence that scholars of genocide and mass atrocity crimes um, study. The, when we think about authoritarian states, there are generally fewer constraints on the exercise of power. There's a greater um, amount of suppression of dissent. They tend to be more reactive, more extreme in their solutions. And authoritarianism is often built upon narrow notions of who belongs and who doesn't. And what we've seen around the world, even ostensibly stable democratic societies, um, have been failing, have been backsliding to use this term. In fact, the US was for the first time last year ranked as a backsliding democracy. Surveys have shown that young Western Europeans and young Americans are less supportive of the messy business of democracy and more supportive of authoritarian leadership and solutions, right? We want someone who says they've got the answers, they know how to fix things for us, and they know how, who to blame. It's appealing. But this is worrying in a country that prides itself as this, what is the term, the, the beacon on the hill, to have young people expressing less and less support for our, what we define ourselves as being a, a paradigm, a, a paragon of. Um, so what happens when these people are coming into communities? And think about this. Millions of people on the move, and that number is, ah, it's a number. But when you think that all of those numbers represent people like us, and I think about the people who engage in incredibly dangerous journeys, such as across the Darien Gap um, from South America into Central America, or people who risk not just themselves, but their children, their families, in dangerous crossings of the Mediterranean. And by the way, the Mediterranean is now the world's most dangerous border there is, uh, in terms of the number of people who've been killed. Um, you've got to be desperate to put yourself in that kind of risk. What are they going to come to? They're going to be coming in countries that are going to be doing, um, are struggling in their own way to deal with these kind of issues. And it's easy to understand how these kind of processes can make communities less than receptive, less than open to greeting these strangers, these newcomers to their shores. We know that when people are scared, when people are anxious, when people are uncertain, it brings up fear. And fear doesn't always bring out the best in us. In fact, what we know, um, there's a lot of research that shows during tough times, people become more reactive, more willing to support tougher policies, more willing to support leaders who embrace getting tough on this issue or that issue. We also have to understand that the ways in which persecution can play out in its most le lethal form is not necessarily going to be what we've seen in the past. 
I would argue that the genocides of tomorrow are not going to look like what we think about. Most of us tend to think of the Holocaust immediately as the paradigmatic model of genocide. The trains, the gas chambers, the concentration camps. Um, but I don't think the genocides of tomorrow are necessarily going to look like that. Um, are we going to live in an era where we begin triaging populations, where we think about that medical terms, deciding who gets the resources and who doesn't? During the Cambodian genocide, the Khmer Rouge had a phrase, to keep you is no gain, to destroy you is no loss. Is this a mindset that we are going to see increasingly as people are struggling with these existential questions within their own communities? Will we see populations defined as superfluous, as a drain, as to borrow term from uh, the Nazis, useless eaters, um, people being seen as expendable. There's a term that was developed a number of years ago by a, um, a very, uh, an amazing genocide scholar, a woman by the name of Helen Fine. And she talked about this idea of genocide by attrition, where you kill through neglect. It's not about physically attacking, but it's about keeping people in conditions or in places where they're unable to sustain their lives. It is something that you can say, we're not doing anything, we're not, you know, we're not trying to hurt anyone, but those policies, the consequences of those will be destructive. And for those on the receiving end of this, it doesn't matter. Genocide through intentional neglect. But, there's still hope. And I will tell you this, I'm more hopeful today than I used to be. Now, it might be therapy, it might be drugs, we don't know, <laughs> we're not going there. Um, but in truth, I do think there's a lot more room for hope than, there, than I had when I began doing work in this. Keep in mind, what I've been talking about here, we're talking about worst case scenarios, where this can go if we don't pay attention, if we don't work to ameliorate this. I've been studying violence for over 30 years now. And the one thing that all violence is, it is contingent. And what I mean by that, it is about choices. Violence is never inevitable. Violence is never preordained. It's uh, unavoidable. Violence is all about um, choices that people, that communities, that groups make. And we also know that communities can come together, not just come apart. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done looking at the ways in which when catastrophe happens in some communities, differences are put aside, differences are forgotten as people to come together just as human beings to help each other. We know that the U.S. has rejoined various climate initiatives. There's a greater awareness and a willingness to tackle climate change. In fact, one of the wonderful things I'm seeing is that in places, even including the U.S., where the government is not seen as reacting fast enough, local communities are actually stepping up and doing things. Even big cities, places like Miami, New York, and other places are actually beginning the work of addressing this, not waiting for national level directives. There's greater awareness and activism. Um, Greta Thunberg, have any of you seen the picture of her way back in like 2016, standing in front of the Swedish parliament building all by herself holding up the sign? Okay, all by herself, holding up a sign. Just some kid, who is she? A few years later, something like eight million young people around the world walked out of schools in a climate strike. Boy, think about the impact that one person can make, right? That's inspiring. We are incredibly adaptable, creative as a species. We need to harness that. And as I said, I see people coming together sometimes around some of these kind of issues. This is not such fringe anymore. We're waking up and that's what gives me hope. We're slow, the time, you know, the clock is ticking. The window for us to limit climate change um, to manageable levels, that window is shrinking. It, we're not stopping it. 
It is here for the foreseeable future. The real question is, how will we meet those challenges? You like those pictures, by the way? Yeah. All right. Thank you. I went a little over. I apologize. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Alex, for a wonderfully wide-ranging talk. Um, if there are questions, um, which I'm sure there will be, um, if you could just wait, I, I have a microphone to bring around. So um, if you could uh, raise your hand, I'll bring this around to you or pass it down to you. I'm curious, you were saying research has been done about communities coming together in a crisis, mm -hmm. not falling apart. Um, I'd be curious to know kind of what some of those factors are. What What's the difference between a community that comes to <clears> that's the, that That's an incredibly important question, right? Um, I think about the work, for example, Sebastian Junger in, I think it was Tribe or Tribes that he wrote about uh, some of these issues. Um, there's a book that came out not so long ago called A Paradise Built in Hell. Um, these are a couple of examples, good accessible reads to, get, to look at some of these issues. Typically what we find is that uh, these are natural disasters that have happened, things that are calamitous. Um, think about uh, avalanches or, or flooding. And what we often find is that they tend to be in smaller communities where people, um, even if there have been some tensions or, or distinctions, but where people are able to somehow um, move past those, right? They, they see each other in need and are able to come together. We know that leadership plays an important role in this as well. And in fact, we know that the kind of leadership um, you have plays a huge role in, so for example, um, Scott Strauss, a genocide scholar, did work looking at a number of nations in Africa engaged in warfare, that all of them looked like they could escalate to genocide. Some did, some did not. And one of the key elements there was the role of leaders in either amplifying the distinctions or suppressing those and essentially um, advocating and working to bring people together, right? So there's a lot that goes into this. I don't know that there's a formula. Here's what we need. But there are some very interesting patterns to some of these that I think we really need to begin taking a hard look at and how we can work on nurturing and fostering those tendencies rather than those of division. Yeah, talk about the future of Holocaust and genocide education. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. thank you. Excellent question. Wonderful. So there's two questions online. Maybe I can okay. ask both of them and you sure. can, um, you know, take whichever one you want or both in turn. The first one is from Paul C. And he asks, what can we do as educators to be part of the solution? Um, and then the second one is from Kia O. And they are asking, do you know of any good organizations to join to advocate for this? I think this being, um, you know, some of the coming together solutions. Sure. I, I, I love those questions. They're wonderful questions because it's about what can I do? And I know the one thing that I, uh, you know, I get for many people, even for myself and people I know who study this, is that it feels overwhelming. It's just so huge, so depressing. It's a lot easier just to, you know, watch the latest, um, I don't know, TV. show, yeah, exactly, I, I don't know. I was gonna come up with something funny, I couldn't even think of anything, sorry. Um, so, there are a lot of organizations out there. And, you know, what I would suggest is this. Do your homework, look and see what's out there, and then just pick one. Pick one that resonates with you, right? You can't solve everything, you can't address every issue, but you can certainly choose okay, this is going to be my, my cause and so forth, right? I would also argue that the kind of things we do around, for example, ameliorating climate change impacts by, oh, I'm going to take a shorter shower. Um, you know, I used to take long showers so I could, for my hair, but uh, <laughs> that's kind of slowed down a bit. But, or, or turn off the water when you're 
you know, brushing and so forth. Recycle, I recycle. You know, I'm doing my part. The reality actually is, you can, we can all recycle till we're blue in the face and save water, and it only represents a tiny fraction. What's more important is how we as uh, communities and nations um, relate to the world around us in terms of our consumption, right? So think about how we consume and, and think about putting pressure on or using our voice as citizens to elect individuals, right, to positions where they can make big impacts in regards to these big industries and so forth. And we are seeing that. The world you're living in today, the stuff you're taking for granted, I don't know if you realize this, for some of us older folks, the world's almost sometimes unrecognizable. And the world you live in when you're older will not be the world you're living in today. It will be very, very different, but hopefully in some good ways as well in terms of our economic systems, our, you know, all these other kind of things. So I'm not gonna say like this organization or that, or, there's so many out there, honestly. But here's where I will also say something even more practical. It, all, it begins at home. And in this context, I'm not talking about climate change per se, I'm talking about the consequences of climate change. And this is something I've over the years giving talks about genocide or the Holocaust and so forth, you know, and the lessons and all this other kind of stuff. The real question, what it comes down to is how do we treat people in our own community who are different? Do we turn a blind eye to the suffering of others? Do we stand quietly by while others are persecuted, right? These are ways we can all make a difference. And in the aggregate, those are powerful. And what gives me hope is I see young people today who are more and more willing to want to live lives that matter, that make a positive impact on the world and on others, uh, rather than just taking and consuming and those kind of things. I don't know if that directly answers those questions. I hope it kind of gets towards what the questioners were asking. Those are great questions, so thank you for those. But um, that's what I got. Oh, hello, I'd just like to thank you for like coming out. Um, but uh, so in terms of like governments like reacting to like genocides like that are currently, do you think like they should be like stay like mind their own business or like kind of like you know like when Hitler was going across to other like places like start having some intervention at some point like do you think there should be like a lot because it's I don't know wow. it's like you're thank kind you of for that thing. very easy question to answer <laughs> yeah because like because like obviously like in history we haven't been doing or like mm -hmm. right now we're not but uh, you know, this is one of the stumbling blocks when it comes to genocide and mass atrocity prevention, right? We live in a world dominated by the nation state system. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. And one of the bedrocks of that is this notion of sovereignty, right? This idea that um, within states, you have the legitimate governments have the sole authority within it, um, within that bounded container. The there is no simple answer to that question. And there have been attempts to weaken sovereignty, um, but that's often been met with a huge amount of resistance, right? And it doesn't help that nation states have often been very selective about when they use the G word and when they don't, and has a lot to do with their own interests, their own alliances, and so forth. I still remember back in the 90s when um, Rwanda was in the news, the nightly news, this was in the days when I had to turn the dial myself. Um, every night there were horrific scenes coming out of Rwanda that clearly were genocidal and the State Department did not want to use the word genocide so kept dancing around um, its use of the word. Um, but actually something even worse happened is we started using the word genocide, didn't do anything and nothing happened. Oh, oh okay. Um, there have been attempts to change culture around um, sovereignty. And I'm thinking here about the Canadian government's um, sponsoring of the R2P, um, the responsibility to protect, that governments have a responsibility to protect their citizens, 
right? And when you're not doing that, other states have an obligation, if you will, or a responsibility to intervene. The problem that we know is that the kind of interventions we think about when we think about genocide prevention tend to revolve around immediate action tools, which generally revolve around the military. And as we know, that is a fraught um, uh, option that very often it, the kind of military intervention we want to engage in is, um, comes with a lot of, um, I hate to use this term, but a lot of the collateral consequences, right? Um, where you, you have it spiral in ways that were not predicted, right? I, I think, for example, about the invasion of, the US invasion of Afghanistan, um, or Iraq, um, or things like this. Um, for my money, real genocide prevention happens a lot, for, a lot earlier. If you're at that stage where you're having to contemplate a military action to prevent an ongoing human rights crisis that's happening in, at your doorstep, um, it's, it almost feels like it's too late. That a lot of work has to be done beforehand. Um, in regards to not just using all of the suite of tools, whether it's diplomatic, economic, um, communication, and uh, pressure, you name it. There, there's a whole array, right? And there are those who have um, really taken a hard look at some of these. I think about Jim Waller's book um, on genocide prevention. Scott Strauss wrote a book on genocide prevention. And all of them you know, illustrate so many of these techniques. I don't know of an easy answer to your question, to be honest. Um, to my way of thinking, we need to get better at, uh, at addressing the underlying issues that make populations and leaderships vulnerable to what we can call that genocidal impulse, so that we don't arrive at that place where we're, we're contemplating going in with military forces. Does that make sense at all? Yeah. yeah. Um, but we've not been very good at it. Um, and in fact, one of the things, all of the progress we've made in terms of reducing um, extreme poverty and um, food insecurity and so forth, many of these advances that have been hard won have been um, set back years, if not decades, by this pandemic, right? That we are still now still kind of coming out of, if you will. Great question. I wish I had a, a I feel like I'm that typical academic. It depends, or you know, I never give you a straight answer, but I, I don't know that there is an easy answer with something like that. It's something a lot of people are working on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so you said that the U.S. is not exempt from all of these issues, right? Um, and I wanted to know if you, in your studies, have experienced or like um, seen a difference in the amount of violence or you know unrest within the continental U.S. versus remote U.S. and the territories that exist, like like Puerto Rico. And so have like, we seen more violence? Yeah, like violence and unrest and... Within the U.S.? Versus the, like the continental U.S. versus the, their remote territories like Hawaii, Alaska. I have not specifically focused on different U.S. territories or protector or anything like this. But here's what we do know. Has there been a backlash against uh, refugees and immigrants here in the United States? Absolutely. Have we seen record levels of hate crimes in the US in recent years? Absolutely. In fact, we've just seen another huge spike in anti-Semitism. But that's something that we've been seeing now for uh, quite a number of years. Um, we are seeing more and more um, rhetoric and anti-refugee anti-immigrant imagery, um, hate speech, and violence accompanying that. And we've seen this against Asian Americans, we have seen it against blacks and African Americans, Latino populations, uh, native populations, and anti-Semitism. Um, the two most common forms of hate crime in the United States currently are those which target blacks and African Americans, and those um, religiously based anti-Semitism is by far. We've seen Islamophobia increase um, uh, significantly, but it is anti-Semitism which is still the most common.
and so the fear is that uh, these things are often linked. So for example, the tree of life shooter who was recently convicted in federal court, I believe, right? He went into the synagogue in uh, Squirrel Hill, uh, Pittsburgh. He had been radicalized online and their, um, his belief was that wealthy Jews were funding caravans of refugees and immigrants from Central and South America to come into the U.S. to destabilize the U.S. and to essentially replace the white race. So what we're seeing is these things come together, right? So these kind of prejudices, these old ideas are, are being reshaped in modern times, right? And it's crazy to me, ideas that came out of the Middle Ages, things like the blood libel, the protocols and so forth, we're seeing them reappear in different guises, right? Um, so the answer is yes, we are seeing some of these things now. We're seeing backlashes in some communities where we're seeing, we're on the verge of another great era of American relocation, right? Maybe your parents or grandparents' generation was from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt, these kind of mass changes. And these often came at a significant social cost in terms of you know, inequality and, and all kinds of, of stuff. We're, we're, we are starting to see more and more of that. Um, so the answer in short is yes, we are seeing that here. Um, the things we're seeing in Europe, the things we're seeing in other places, they're, they're local as well. Thank you. Yeah. I think we've come to the, uh, the end of our hour. Um, we do have um, some nibbles and some drinks out in the, uh, the hallway, so we'd invite you all to, uh, to come out and join us and to, uh, to chat a little bit more uh, informally with, uh, with Professor Alvarez. But before we bring things to a conclusion, uh, I hope everybody will join me in putting their hands together and thanking him for really wonderful <laughs>